This is Joel, and it is October 29th, 1957, and we are at Halico. That is our home out here in Hawaii. And we are starting a work today that has long been necessary but which has awaited the proper hour and setting. In order for the message of the infinite way to continue as an experience in the future, it must be understood from the nature of its origin and its operation and there must also be provided the means and uh, the persons through whom this activity is to be continued on a worldwide scale as long as there is a response to its message. For 11 years now, I have watched students come to this work, and students go from it, and sometimes those who have gone from it return. But out of the 11 years of work, there are some who have come and who have never left it. And in the years in which they have been a part of the work, they have become set aside because of their work and thereby become a part of what I shall hereafter call our inner working group. In 1950, when I was left as an individual without any human help, the work was carried on as a purely one-man work with the occasional help of a stenographer when The going was too heavy. But soon after, Emma came into the picture, helping with the organization and starting and experimentation of the tape work, and then gradually took over the letter department and the banking department and the tax department until I was completely free and uh, able to travel whenever and wherever the call came. And thus came the first of the workers who have been very close to me from that time until the present, and with every indication that this will be a permanent relationship both here and hereafter. Only Flynn had come into the picture as a student back about 1948 or 1949 coming from Oklahoma to California for classes and then together with his wife Aileen appeared with us in all of our classwork wherever held all the way from 
California to New York and from New York back to Hawaii and again to California or Chicago or the Northwest, wherever it might be. And there has never been a break in the continuity of Olney's work or of his active support of this activity in every possible way. Eileen Bowden came into the picture about 1949 through my work in Victoria, Canada, Vancouver, and then over into Seattle and Portland. And her part of the work has been primarily the spiritual support and uh, the opening of the work in and around Victoria and uh, engaging in the healing activity and of course with a great amount of work in the direction of imparting a spiritual truth to children. Floyd Nowell came into the picture in Hawaii. Also back about 1951 and is one of those who has never wavered a step or a day and uh, who has been with me constantly almost every day that I have been in Hawaii Floyd has been with me hours and hours and hours many times of each day studying imbibing now finally active in both healing and teaching Lorraine Sinkler came into the picture in Chicago on my first visit there about 1949 and from the very moment of our meeting was touched by a spiritual experience which has brought her ever closer to the work until eventually she was led to give up her entire life's work to devote all of her time and all of her experience all of her activity to this infinite way work and of course it is she who is editing our monthly letters and our published writings The other is Daisy Shigamura, who also came into our work about 1949 on my first trip to Hawaii, and soon thereafter had a spiritual experience in meditation, and who at the present time is, and for some time past, has been active in healing work and more especially imparting this particular message to those of the Japanese race. These whom I've mentioned are really the closest to me because of the opportunity I've had to be with them so much and they to be with me so much and therefore given me the opportunity of observing the fact that in their lives nothing is important except living the life of spiritual illumination and imparting it to the world through the message of the infinite way and so these constitute this inner group of workers or inner working group since we cannot all of us be physically present with each other at all times the work which we are starting today will be with Floyd now and Emma and insofar as it is possible 
whatever takes place will be recorded as this is being recorded with the understanding that these tapes will be available only to those whom I have just mentioned and with a further understanding that no one will be added to this group except in one of two ways I myself can select out of the world anyone or as many as I feel and find ready to become part of this inner group and aside from that the only way that anyone can be admitted will be by the other members of this group unanimously inviting one or more into the group and this of course means that whoever is suggested must first of all be known to all of these who are part of the group but must be personally known and each one of this group must be personally convinced of the readiness of the one proposed to be accepted into the group and in such case then a unanimous decision can result in inviting that one or those others to participate now the reason for all this must be clear <clears throat> there's only one reason that I occupy the position in the infinite way that I do that is that I am the author of the writings the teacher of its principles the traveler who has carried it into all of the Protestant world and who has been entrusted with the responsibility of its activity its financing the drawing unto me those who were and are to assist in this work since I first received the unfoldment that resulted in the writing of the book The Infinite Way and the activity that has since followed I am guided in everything at all times by something something with a capital S that is within the scope the range of my own consciousness I know that it seems strange at times that I never seek advice on anything and on the few occasions when advice is offered that I pay no more attention to it than a passing breeze and it isn't because I feel that I know more than anyone else it is only that insofar as it relates to the activity of the infinite way I need no human guidance because there is something within me that provides the advice the guidance the direction and has shown itself capable of supporting the activity financially and drawing unto itself those workers necessary to be a part of it not only in the United States and Canada in Europe and South Africa and Australia wherever the message traveled it drew unto itself those necessary for its expression and all of this accomplished by whatever it is within me that is responsible for the entire work now first of all I would like our inner group to realize this perhaps to realize it more fully than they do at this moment that I have never done anything of myself in connection with the infinite way nor used my judgment or my opinion or my beliefs 
that at all times there is something operating that guides and directs and leads that gives me the words to say the time to travel and uh, all that goes there with I might put it this way that that something drew Emma to me at a time when it seemed impossible to get this tape recording work started a work which has proved its efficacy which has proved its value and yet I myself could not get it underway and the people who started to help me with it in the beginning all fell away and at a moment when I had little idea that such a thing could happen and when I was in the last place in the world where one could expect it to happen out in the Hawaiian Islands with no acquaintances Emma was so drawn to this work that she quickly became a part of the tape work and ultimately worked out the whole solution to that work and was able to take over its responsibility and I look upon this as uh, the activity of this something within that is prospering the activity of the message of the infinite way in this same way Floyd was drawn into this work and not only in the way that he himself could benefit but that through his activity the infinite way drew unto itself the tremendous amount of help sometimes financial sometimes in moral support sometimes in actual taking over of healing work and so forth so that it is evident that again a stranger was drawn unto me out of this world a stranger one whom I had no way of knowing and uh, who himself had to be drawn to this work by some invisible thread in the same way that now when it is so evident that our writings must be properly edited for publication by responsible and uh, worldwide known publishers that Lorraine Sinclair out of all the world should be drawn to me from a world as far different from mine as the imagination can encompass and yet without seeking her and certainly she was not seeking me but in her inner soul was seeking God or truth and was incidentally so it would outly, outwardly seem led to visit me while on a trip to Chicago and out of that meeting and just think in the same day in which I met her I must have met 50 others and had talks with each one of them out of all this Lorraine has been drawn to where she is a most important part of this work and to such an extent that our group must understand that regardless of any other circumstance Lorraine must be kept at the editing of these writings until this also is an accomplished work <clears throat> now <clears throat> I bring this point to light because I could go on also and tell you how uh, or rather tell you that only Flynn and Daisy Shigemura and Eileen Bowden are in my consciousness parts of this working group and that they also have been drawn in the same invisible way to whatever work they are doing now this is lesson number one in the, the mystical life for until 
an individual arrives at that state of consciousness in which something within takes over they're leading the ordinary human life in which their entire world is lived by virtue of their personal experience their personal wisdom their personal physical strength and so forth and so on now I have no way of knowing the nature of that something which governs my life and the activity of the infinite way I could not say to you that this presence or these presences are persons I cannot definitely say that there is a Jesus Christ or a Buddha or a Lao Tzu or a John or whether or not this influence or these influences are God itself spiritually acting within me without mediation in other words I have no knowledge of any man or woman who ever lived upon the face of the globe who is consciously creating or spreading the message of the infinite way through me I do know that there are spiritual activities taking place within me and that these govern my experience certainly I know that I have been greatly influenced in uh, the phraseology in uh, the voicing of the message by principles which are parts of such teachings as Lao Tzu or Zen or Shankara or the Gospel of John or the direct unfoldment of that mind which was also in Christ Jesus or even not principles which are enunciated in Hebrew mysticism Christian mysticism Oriental mysticism oh yes I know that this literature has influenced the language of the infinite way but not the principles themselves the principles have been the direct result of inner unfoldment not given to me by any man or woman of the present or the past yes some of the basic principles in the letter of truth were learned in uh, Christian science and must be credited to Mrs. Eddy for all of us must somewhere have our eyes opened and uh, often that awakening comes from something said or written by the great mystics of the world without any question of doubt my whole attention was drawn to the fact that in spiritual living and in spiritual healing the major factor must be an understanding of the nature of error and what to do about it the acknowledgement that God is all which we all know to be true in its spiritual sense the dependence upon God which in a religious sense has wrecked most of the world the longing for God the search for God none of these things have resulted in uh, bringing about spiritual harmony into the lives of individuals or in attaining a healing consciousness so much 
as that which has been unfolded to us from the beginning received by us in Christian science of this nature of error. And here we come to what I might call lesson number two, although I will not continue to number these lessons, but let them follow automatically as they may, and without relationship to their importance to each other, or the order in which they come. It is not possible to know God in any way that the mind can conceive. In other words, we can never see, hear, take, taste, touch, or smell God, nor can we reach God with a reasoning mind or the thinking mind or by a reasoning process or an analytical one. In other words, to human sense, God is unknowable. Therefore, it behooves us to give up the attempt to reach God, to find God, or to know God in any human way. So the question then comes, then in what way can God be known? The answer is, God can only be known through the faculties of the soul when these are awakened and opened in an individual. Now there is no other way. God will never be known to man through the five physical senses or the mind of man. And therefore, and this that I say, of course, is the result of experience, not hearsay, God may be known through the soul faculties when they are awakened and aroused in an individual. The next question is, how do we attain that opening whereby we may know God, whereby we may experience God? And the answer is that by our study of Scripture and truth, the writings of the Infinite Way, Even though this study is conducted with the mind, we are led to the practice of meditation. Between the study of the written and spoken word and inner meditation, we are led to a state which may be called communion with God, in which inwardly we feel that there is actually a presence of God within us and ourselves in a communion with each other, as if there were a feeling going back and forth, as if there were a presence to which we could speak and say, Father, illumine me. Father, reveal thyself to me. Father, open my inner awareness. Give me ears with which to hear, give me eyes with which to see. And uh, often a response will come from that withinness. And thereby we know that we are in a state of communion with God. You see here, there is two-ness. There is individual you or me, and there is a presence sensed within, felt within. It may even be a feeling of love, warmth, gentleness, peace within. And uh, in this state, we are in communion. Now, <clears throat> at that stage, we are, or rather the soul consciousness, the soul faculties are partly opened, at least they are opening. 
they must be opening to attain a state of actual communion experienced communion and then be continuing in the hearing of the word and the reading of the word and the meditation and the communion leads to that final step of union with God conscious union with God oh yes you will remember that at all times the relationship of God the Father and God the Son being one is established has been established from the beginning and will be unto the end of time but it is only in the degree of our conscious communion with God and finally our conscious union with God that this oneness is realized in experience and demonstrated in the harmonies of uh, our experience now in this you see <clears throat> we have not depended on any God for anything no look to any God for anything and hereby we have learned another of our great principles and that is God cannot give us anything or impart anything to us for literally there is nothing but God and so it is that the people of the world defeat their own purpose when they seek harmonies in their experience when they go to God for health or wealth or opportunity or home or companionship they lose out the only possible attainment is the attainment of communion with God and ultimately union with God having attained that realization the infinity which God truly is is ours and then all of the light of God all of the guidance and direction support supply maintenance necessary to our experience unfolds naturally through the relationship of conscious communion and conscious union with our source the kingdom of God within our own being now you can see how foolish it is to seek advice any more than it is to seek dollars you say we need dollars yes you say we need advice yes both on the human plane when you see this vision you will know that you need only one thing your conscious communion with God your conscious realization of God your conscious oneness with God and then you literally demonstrate in some measure Paul's statement I live yet not I Christ liveth in me this spiritual presence liveth in me this spiritual power goes before me to make the crooked place straight this literally has been my experience in the message of the infinite way as those of you close around me have seen you know that I have had no human background to draw upon no human wealth to draw upon no human wisdom to draw upon but yet you have seen that in every necessary experience there has been something take place which outwardly manifested as uh, the right thing done at the right time the right person drawn unto this work at the right time the right amount of dollars drawn into this work at the right time never for selfish purposes for then you break the contact with your invisible source now you who start with me in this in a group must understand that your individual goal must be to live each day so that you do attain the inner guidance to all of your affairs 
Otherwise, you are not only less fitted to govern your personal lives, business, families, but completely, totally unfit to have any say in the direction of the message of the infinite way. For this is not a matter of human wisdom or human opinion, but for a direct spiritual guidance which may sometimes contradict everything that is sensible in the outer world or in the outer scheme of things. Vision. Spiritual vision is what you must have. And a help in attaining it is being certain every single day that no selfish motive guides you. If you have a single thing in mind other than the ultimate activity of the infinite way and its promotion, you will forfeit the very thing you are seeking. For no one can boast in the Lord, no one can brag of their conduct with God, no believe for a moment that God selects them for special favor. Or that God's grace is for personal glorification. If it isn't clear to you that it is the infinite way itself which must eventually do its work in the world, that even those who are attracted to this message are not for our personal glory, and the dollars that are attracted to it are not to be spent on our personal whims or human living, except to the extent that in showing forth God's glory it is naturally manifested in the right sense of home or the right sense of economic security. But this is far different from feeling that money belongs to us personally or that withholding any part of what we have in some way enriches us or protects us in the future. Remember, we are enriched only in the degree of our conscious union with God. We are protected only, whether it's the present or the future, by the realization of our constant relationship with God. Therefore, we do not speak so much of uh, God, since we know that God is not to be known in our human experience, but in teaching we speak of the nature of God since it is possible by the fruitage of God's activity in this world to know that the very nature of God must be an infinite intelligence. The very nature of God must be a divine love. These must be the two outstanding qualities or properties which constitute God being. And therefore, in that realization, even though only humanly realized, we can sufficiently relax our fears, our concerns, so that that which we have called the Christ or the Spirit of God in us that governs, guides, leads, directs, supports, maintains, sustains, that it may at all times be in conscious, functioning, focus, activity. It is a safe guide to ask yourself when any question arises, is this for which I am going to God something for my personal benefit, my personal glory, my personal profit, my personal ambition, my personal self? And then quickly the false sense of self will drop away and you will realize that there is no power of receiving God's grace for personal glorification or profit. In this way, then, you are fitted to govern the affairs of the infinite way. For you see now that we set the stage only 
to meet an immediate need. Realizing that as situations change, God provides the answer with which to meet those changes. Therefore, in setting our infinite way stage, we recognize that I, Joel, as long as I can function in this capacity, will continue to function. That in the normal course of events, Emma will take my place as executive director of the entire work. Feeling, however, that she has the benefit of Lorraine, of Floyd, of Eileen, of Daisy, in upholding her hand spiritually, morally, financially if necessary, and in the fulfillment of the different functions which they may at any given time be performing. As I have said, Lorraine at the present time editing, Floyd at the present time teaching, healing. All of this, you might must remember, may change at any moment. And Floyd may have some other activity, and uh, Lorraine some other activity. And so I am not trying to govern the infinite way from the grave or from retirement. I'm merely trying to outline how this inner group shall serve the infinite way in uh, the capacity of each at any given time. And also to provide that those who comprise this group shall have the privilege of adding to it not only for the purpose of our spiritual uh, unfoldment, but for its continuity and progression. Now, there is a major reason why this work has been started today. This, that I've outlined above that pertains to the idea of continuity and succession, is only a secondary motive in uh, preparing this tape. The main motive was in giving you these spiritual principles to serve as a basis for your demonstration and the demonstration of the infinite way and to lead up to this. Long years ago, I recognized that <clears throat> even though I should continue to sit in an office and heal 20 or 50 or 100 people a day for the rest of my days, that I would have made no dent in the sin, disease, and death of this world. A few individuals out of billions of individuals would have been temporarily benefited, and that's all. And so I knew that there was to be a deeper significance to my life and that significance was given to me in 1946 when I received two months of daily inner initiation and illumination which started my activity in this infinite way. I knew then, and it was given me then, that my unfoldment was to be the bringing forth of those principles which would not merely heal individuals here and there, but which would remove sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation from off the face of the globe, or, to put it in uh, the Master's way of speaking, to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven, or to bring about the second coming of the Christ. These are merely religious terms describing what the state of consciousness on earth will be after the principles have been revealed and demonstrated that removes material sense from the earth and thereby leaves the earth heaven. Remember that the earth with material sense removed is heaven just as a human being with uh, 
material sense removed as a spiritual being. A mortal who attains a realization of God's presence becomes the son of God or an immortal. You are a mortal until the Spirit of God dwells in you. Then do you become the sons of God. So it is. Remove material sense from any individual and you have removed the capacity to sin, to be sick, or to die. Remove material sense from this globe and you will make impossible wars, bad competition, enmities, bigotries, and all of these conditions that herefore have resulted in bad blood between uh, humans on earth and ultimately wars of destruction. We then, in the infinite way, have been given certain principles whereby it is possible to destroy in a measure at this time material sense and in my personal life and practice I have demonstrated the ability to remove personal sense or dissolve it in individuals and in a measure in some major national and international affairs. Now, of course, I'm speaking only as a beginner, as one who has only seen the first faint glimpses. Sometimes I think of myself as uh, the Wright brothers must have felt when their airplane flew 57 seconds. I am at that stage of spiritual development when I have brought about that much demonstration. And uh, at that point, at this point where I am now, I'm saying to you that I know the principles whereby material sense is dissolved as completely, as surely as the Wright brothers knew the principles of flying when they flew 57 seconds. They knew the principle, but they had only demonstrated it up to 57 seconds, or they knew that with those same principles we would ultimately fly a thousand miles an hour and keep it up forever if we wished to. And I know with what grain I have seen that the principle operates. I personally have only been able to operate it at that 50 second, 57 second level. But I know that the principle in its completeness will be demonstrated to rule all material sense, mortal discord, off the face of this globe in proportion as we learn to practice, perfect ourselves, improve ourselves, spiritualize ourselves through the attainment of a higher spiritual consciousness than we have at this moment. Now, Emma and Floyd and I are starting a program of daily meetings. The first purpose of which is to attain within ourselves a greater degree and depth of spiritual consciousness, God realization, and to apply these principles as we understand them to the destruction of material sense, not merely in our individual lives or those of our patients or students, but now taking on a wider activity by going out into the field of world affairs and seeking to know what influence the application of these principles may have on such affairs. 
we made no conscious effort <coughs> to carry our students through this many months epidemic of Asian flu and yet up to this moment I have not received from any of our students or any of our practitioners the word or any word that this epidemic has touched our circle of students in the United States of Canada and so far as I know England, Australia and South Africa. If our circle has been at all touched, and I mean by that the entire student body of the infinite way, it must have been to such a small extent that no one single word of it has reached us here at headquarters, nor has a single call for help come from that particular plane. Now, this is exactly what I mean by the work that we are going to undertake. We did not consciously seek that particular demonstration. But as a result of that work which I have personally conducted for the entire activity of the infinite way around the globe, this has been the result. Now, what greater results may be achieved by this work which we now undertake will develop as we proceed. Naturally, our work here will be done in this atmosphere with the physical presence only of Emma Floyd and myself. However, as soon as you are this inner working group have copies of this tape and those that follow you will undertake this work only since each of you is in a different city you will have to undertake it without help from any human your support will come to you from us over here in Hawaii and we will specifically and consciously give to each of you in this group daily support as you will learn to give us so that eventually we will be united in this consciousness regardless of where we may physically be. You will select any hour of the day or night for this work that is most convenient to you, remembering that it must be at such a period when you are subject to the least disturbance, either from the noises of the world or of your family life. And it should be those periods of time to which you can dedicate yourself self without hurry, without rushing. There is no specific length of time for the activity of this work, since no one knows how quickly you will attain that state of consciousness necessary for this work. We three will meet every day from 1.30 to 3 p.m. Honolulu time and our work will be mostly conducted within that time although there are evenings when we are together here when at 10 or 11 o'clock at night we may resume for a second session. This will not be nightly, whereas the afternoon work will definitely be daily 
while we three are here together. There again, when we travel, Ella and I will conduct it wherever we are, and Floyd will conduct it wherever he is, and uh, again, at such times as he has the greatest amount of freedom from outside interruption. Do not confuse this work that we are doing with the work of the 25 which is now being conducted, for that work is but a preliminary to this work which we are doing. Within uh, the next few days you will see in these tapes that we will be doing a specific work which at the present time could not be undertaken by a large group for I would have no way of voicing to a large group that which is in my mind. And there would be no use of it until such time as we are so experienced and so proficient and can point to such definite specific successes that we will want to enlarge this group. You see now that we will enlarge this group after we have attained enough measure of success to warrant it, and then we will invite in those of that group of 25 who have demonstrated that they have been able to keep with that work and accomplish something from it. Though, of course, we will not be limited only to that group of 25. We will select wherever we find a dedicated state of consciousness, and each person has to decide for themselves what they consider dedicated. It is naturally understood that neither this tape nor any that follow in this series is to be heard by anyone outside of the individuals already named or those who may later be added to this group. This, group. this is October 30th, and Floyd, Emma, and I are meeting to start our first specific activity in accord with our outline of yesterday. We will first meditate, and uh, our object in this meditation will be to, to be receptive to whatever unfoldment or direction may come to us, and then we will act on the result of the meditation. We meditated only a minute when it came to me to say this, that the object of our meditation being to seek guidance in the next step, that should anything be given to me or to Floyd or Emma, that our meditation should be interrupted so that whatever was given could be shared with the three of us. And uh, it must be remembered that we are sitting here very much as if we were amateurs, rank beginners in this work, since we have no knowledge of uh, the full reason for our being here, or how the goal that originally brought us together in this work is to be fulfilled. And so it will be with you that even though in the back of your mind is the goal that we are in some way or other to 
be a witness to the dissolving of material sense, you will have no more each day than we have now as to what the mode or means of that activity will be. And so you will be as completely in the dark as you go into meditation as we are. We have been meditating 28 minutes and uh, this is the first thing that is given me and it is for us here and for you. You have all sat with me in meditation and you have all felt the fruitage of that experience. In some cases, meditating with me, that is when we were both physically present together and in meditation, you have felt everything from a slight uplift to an experience of such magnitude that it resulted in lifting you into the higher consciousness, that which is called the fourth dimension. Sometimes in and through this experience have had healings of physical conditions and other healings. Therefore, you know the meaning of where two or more are gathered in my name. And you do know that <clears throat> an individual meditating with one of higher consciousness receives illumination and unfoldment through this experience. Likewise, you yourselves have had others sit with you in meditation and you have had an opportunity to witness the footage of such an experience. Also in the fact that your student received some measure of uplift, illumination, or healing, and sometimes all of these. And so, <clears throat> I will ask you, before you begin your daily meditation for this specific work, that you consciously remember our living room here at Halico. And uh, feel that you are actually sitting in this room. And meditating with us here, since you know that there are three of us already here, and uh, as a result of our meditations, consciousness is very high. And so, before you start your meditation, place yourself in this room, and uh, Realize that you are attuned or at one with the consciousness of us here in this room. And then from that point, start your meditation, always remembering you are in this room. And whether or not anyone is in this room, the consciousness of our daily meditation is here to which you attune yourself. <clears throat> this next meditation was 12 minutes and uh, what was given me is this. How forms of matter are changed by us 
by something other than the application of material energy. Let me explain that. A person has a fever and uh, materially that would be treated by an external application of cold or an internal application of some form of chemical called medicine. Mm. And the application of the power of cold or the power of the medicine would change the form of matter, fever, energy, heat, and transform it down to its normal state. Now we accomplish the same purpose. An individual has a fever, and without the application of cold or medicine, and even separated by thousands of miles, we instantly reduce the fever to a normal temperature. What activity in us, invisible activity, and to the five physical senses, intangible activity, has acted in the physical realm to change the form of matter or energy. And the answer is consciousness. Our consciousness of consciousness as the only power, the only cause, the only substance and the only action, our consciousness of this truth operates to change these forms of matter, whether in the form of fever or lumps or dislocations, growth, nerves, regardless of what physical form of discord we are faced with, consciousness changes those forms, transmutes them into what is called the normal human or physical form. Now the question is, to what extent does our consciousness of this truth operate in so-called human experience to transmute the dross into gold, that is, the inharmony and discord into harmony? To what extent is that possible? We know through our practice that there is practically no limit to the extent of that activity, which is called the activity of healing, insofar as it affects the healing of an individual. We have well established that whether it is a simple cold or a cancer or consumption, and in many instances, broken bones, dislocations, deafness, blindness, sometimes even to a degree of totality, that an activity of consciousness acting upon so-called material form changes the form of the matter or the form of the energy. from the discordant and inharmonious to the so-called normal and natural. 
actually what we have discovered is <coughs> in metaphysical practice that <coughs> every discord and inharmony of a physical nature has its actual seat in a mental activity of some kind whether universal or individual and therefore the consciousness of truth does not really act upon matter the body or form but it acts upon the mind of the individual which in turn acts upon the body or form now in our healing work we realize that most of the discords and inharmonies of the world are universal beliefs and only a few are really personal in nature and even then it's because of the intensity of the universal belief and so our work is not even in the realm of touching the mind of an individual except insofar as our consciousness of truth may touch the mind of the individual who has turned to us for our help so the question that arises now is whether or not our consciousness of truth in uh, touching the universal mind of man will not heal or remove the destructive element of mind universally as well as individually as you know the group that we call the 25 which actually means the group all around the clock that are devoting periods of meditation each day to the realization of truth destroying material sense or dissolving material sense must have been very effective in this matter of the Asian flu which has been epidemic around the world for several months Floyd asked the question last week whether I had had many cases of this Asian flu in uh, my practice or correspondence and my answer was that I hadn't had a single call for help on this subject nor had any of the practitioners written me that they were burdened with these cases and then Floyd told me that in all of his activity here in the islands and uh, correspondence from the mainland that he also had not been called upon for a single case and of course this made me search my thought and I find that in all of my correspondence there has not even been the complaint from any of our students that their families were suffering from this so that even while not claiming that our household may have been completely free of it since I do not necessarily hear from everybody it is evident that we must have been touched very lightly if at all yet in the midst of this heavy epidemic experience and so we must conclude that the work of the 25 that is the work that is being done around the clock has protected the household of our students from this epidemic then evidently the subject has since been active in our work here 
And we find that whereas two days ago, according to the newspapers, there was no break in this epidemic, and no uh, publication of a break, but rather that it was assuming greater proportions, today we find that it is not only broken, but broken way, way down. And so there we are led to believe that this specific work of the past two days may have carried our activity in dissolving material sense into a deeper level of fruitage. This we will continue to observe in this and other ways. This is October thir 31st. And uh, we have met at the usual time, 1.30. We have meditated 25 minutes, and uh, nothing specific has come beyond the fact that all three of us had very, very deep stirrings within that could be physically felt. We will now meditate again. Our second meditation was 15 minutes. And in this, both Emma and Floyd had an unfoldment of exactly the same nature. In fact, identical. But it is of such a nature that it would be too personal to put it on this tape. And so the reason that I am making this comment is to bring to your attention that you will experience, as we already have, some experiences peculiar to you alone. And uh, it is for this that uh, or with this that you will work for whatever purpose it may be given you. In our third meditation today <clears throat> it came to me that from Isaiah the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and I'm ordained to, to heal the sick. And with that came the realization that it is not necessarily any knowledge of truth that we are seeking in these periods, but actually only that the Spirit of the Lord God be upon us. For when it's there, regardless of the fact that there may be no thoughts, no words, no knowledge, the healing influence is in operation. Huh? This is November 1st. And... Uh, we have now a little specific work to do for realization and unfoldment. Ordinarily, our work will be of a universal nature to dissolve that which is called the activity of the mind, material sense. But there are certain aspects of material sense which have not yielded as readily as 
some other claims. And I think that we should take up some specific work to see what kind of an unfoldment we might get In all of my years of practice, I have had two practically instantaneous healings of cataracts and one or two slow healings. But I have had dozens of claims which were not met at all. It does not necessarily follow that these were failures because in some cases the opportunity was not given me to work on it for long periods of time which sometimes is necessary more especially where there may be something in the consciousness of the individual contributing to the experience but I know that there have been cases in which I was given adequate time opportunity and yet did not uh, witness the healing. And at this present time, we have several claims of this nature. And I think that if we do some specific work without any regard to who has these claims or anything of that nature, but merely knowing that in our meditation we seek light on the subject, perhaps we will be given something that may meet this particular situation better than we have in the past. It has been my experience with other practitioners also that this particular claim has been a difficult one to meet. So I would suggest that today we see where we're led in this and as any unfoldment comes to us we will report it on tape also you who are hearing the tape you might at this particular time see what unfoldment comes to you along this line the answer that came immediately to me is that this too is a mind creation and mind and its creation are all the second chapter of Genesis or nothing and therefore we cannot work in that realm at all in other words we do not work or pray about the second chapter of Genesis creation beyond knowing that it is a mind creation and nothingness or the arm of flesh Emma says that instantly it also came to her that they have only the arm of flesh and Floyd says that it instantly came to him that it's either something or nothing and if it's the activity of mind a mind creation, then it's nothing. So let us go forward from here. Now, you know that there is still this matter of the advertising gadget. The principle behind it is that these ads flashed on the screen in front of your eyes so fast that you can't see them nevertheless register in the subconscious and make you perform that which you are instructed to do it has recently been brought out in the newspapers that the two most likely fields for this activity will be politics and religion. <clears throat> the 
But regardless of what purpose it may be used for, it is a direct activity of hypnotism, or call it suggestion in such a strong form as to amount to hypnotism, in which the public is caused to act without its own volition, in a way that it itself does not decide to do. As a matter of fact, to obey impulses that are not its own, that are superimposed upon it from without. This is certainly mass control, or control of the mass mind. Now this is the same principle which produces all the sin and disease there is in the world. Except that this would be projected by individuals, whereas the other is projected by the accumulated activity of individual theory, impressing itself upon the universal mind, and then thence into the individual thought. So that it becomes necessary for us to work daily specifically until we receive some inner realization that will assure us that such mass hypnotism cannot be made to succeed. Now on the first two experiments, it succeeded. On the third, it failed. We have no way of knowing why the third one failed, beyond the fact that I was working specifically on that, but there were certain other aspects of the trial present that defeated it, or helped to defeat it, and uh, so we have really no way of knowing whether we have mastery over that situation or not. Therefore, it's necessary for us to continue until there is some further experiments performed and results made public. Since there is a Wall Street firm interested in promoting this idea, which means that the idea has behind it millions of dollars and influential people. And if it can be made to succeed, that uh, there is no end to the iniquities that it can perform. Because there is at the same time no conscience revealed in the nature of this promotion. No indication that there is any idea or object beyond that of creating another advertising medium. This is a challenge. If this could succeed, there would be no hope on earth for mankind ever to be free of domination by small groups. Because with a concealed weapon of that kind, no man would know when he's being influenced, nor would he have the opportunity to reason or think. since this is an instrument for getting behind man's reasoning or thinking mind into his subconscious without his consent. Let's work on that. Was that recorded, what I was saying? All right, now we have meditated. And the first thing that comes to me is that 
this activity is the activity well it's a hypnotic activity of the particular facet of domination one mind controlling another mind greed it's an activity of uh, a mind activity of greed hypnotic activity of greed hypnotic activity of domination let us see the nothingness of these since mind is an avenue of awareness and not a power it becomes necessary to rise above the knowledge of this into the realization of it All right. It came then that <clears throat> it came then that I alone am the Lord and I only and that I will produce after my own kind and no other. This is November 2nd, this afternoon at, from 1.30 to 3, Daisy Shigemura came in and for the first time heard this entire tape from the beginning up to this point where we left off November 1st. began to take active part the days that she cannot be here she will function just as the rest of you from wherever she is but there will be days in the week in which she will come in and join Floyd Emma and myself meanwhile Floyd was working in on Maui today and so we are here tonight at 9.50 and we'll carry on as if it were the afternoon period. Our first meditation was 25 minutes and in that there was only the ability to achieve an inner peace the second meditation has been 15 minutes and in this one I received a complete release so that as I took up each of the matters on which we are working I very quickly was given release which was the realization, of course, that the Spirit was touching each one of these. Anything with you? <clears throat> On Sunday, the 3rd, we made no recording but Emma and I were here alone and actually the message that came through was one of our most powerful but the meditation continued through the afternoon and the evening late into the night and so no recording was done now however Floyd Emma and I are here again at 1 30 p.m. on the 4th and uh, I will tell you that 
that which revealed itself yesterday was a deeper unfoldment of the nature of God. This is very difficult to put into words except what might, might seem to be cliches or things that you've heard over and over and over again and yet this is different. Think of God for just this moment in somewhat the nature of the sun in the sky. And then realize the futility of praying to it for warmth or for light. The nature of the sun is warmth and light and it is forever expressing itself as a sunbeam constituted of warmth and light. So let us think of God as life forever expressing itself in the form of individual life and then realizing the nature of God life to be eternality, immortality, perfection, infinity it becomes clear that there is nothing to pray about or for or to. From your inner meditations plus your powers of observation you have come to the conclusion that the nature of God is infinite intelligence and divine love. Therefore you know that as infinite intelligence you can neither advise it or teach it anything or acquaint it with anything and in its nature of love always loving you cannot ask it for any form of good. The very nature of infinite intelligence is that which already knows and the nature of divine love is that which is already pouring forth as care and so forth. Now, in this light, the question arises, how then do we as human beings avail ourselves of intelligent and loving government of an infinite intelligence and a divine love? And the answer is that only as we have either a natural or a developed spiritual awareness or faculty can that government of God be established in our experience. But that raises the question of how do we develop, if we haven't already that spiritual sense, how do we develop it? First of all, the recognition of God as infinite intelligence and divine love sets us free from the foolish habit of turning to God for something 
and this in itself begins the development of our spiritual awareness. The ability to live without turning to God for anything is in itself the development of this or unfolding of the spiritual faculty within us. Now mark this. At any time that you would turn to God, you must remember that you are not turning to God. You are turning to some concept of God that you have built within yourself. For there is no such thing as a God that can be turned to for anything. So instantly it must become clear to you when the temptation assails you to turn to God that you are not turning to God but to an image which you have built in your own mind of what God is and what God should do. The life of God, the intelligence of God, and the love of God are manifested only in spiritual ways. And your turning to God would have to be for a material form of good. Since you have no idea at all of what the spiritual universe is or of what you would be seeking. I know not how to pray. I know not how to go in how to come out or what things to pray for as a human being. Therefore, if I prayed for something or turned to God for something, you can be assured of this, it would be for some improved good on the human plane. So, to develop that spiritual faculty means to learn to renounce prayer in the accepted sense of that term, to overcome the temptation to turn to God again as we are taught in the infinite way wisdom that prayer is a state of is read those again now the further development of this spiritual faculty comes to us because of the basic infinite way revelation of the nature of error. Since our entire basis is the no power of any form or effect, of no visible form or effect, what would there be to pray for? Certainly not for anything to be overcome or destroyed or removed. Since there being but one power, spiritual good alone is. And the recognition that that which appears to us as these forms of material good or evil are not something to ask God's intervention about, but something for us to realize in their true nature. Once the true nature of that which is appearing is observed, our spiritual faculty is then at one with, in attunement with, the spiritual or divine government. We block that government by a recognition of something to be overcome, destroyed, or changed. You will, through this lesson, practice more the idea of meditation in which nothing is being sought. And you will approach the healing work in the realization that you are not there for the purpose of healing. And pretty soon, 
something will unfold in each case which will meet the situation because you must remember this there is no one statement of truth or idea of truth which will operate as a healing influence in all of our cases and so it is often the fact that we must seek individual unfoldment I will explain this to you there was a case last week <clears throat> of a fever and I was asked for help I have no knowledge of what the illness was the symptom that was most apparent was the fever and I meditated and had my inner click with no specific truth revealing itself to me and uh, the fever went down to almost normal but about four hours later the fever was back either where it had been or perhaps even higher and again I was asked for help and again I felt the need of meditation but this time I received a specific truth now see this that I wasn't turning to God for anything I was merely shutting out material sense and being receptive to any inner unfoldment that might present itself to me as an evidence of omnipresence or the present harmony and this time the idea came there is no he there's only I and a complete release came and this time the fever disappeared but quickly and did not return now <clears throat> you see the difference of sitting in meditation merely for the unfoldment of omnipresent truth and not specifically for a healing purpose but for the instantaneous realization of is in whatever form it may come if it were only for the purpose of healing then we should meditate only when called upon for a healing but we meditate when called upon or when not called upon and always for the same purpose in a revelation of an is of the is of that which is you see the importance of uh, this gaining a true sense of the nature of God so that there can be God revealing itself within now of course we come to the second part in this human picture really what is it that we're confronted with as appearance there is appearance of physical harmony and physical discord there is the appearance of economic harmony and economic discord there is the appearance of all kinds of harmony and all kinds of discord but actually what is it that is presenting itself to us as these various pictures and the answer is mind the second chapter of Genesis which is a mind creation mind appearing as our world but as long as this mind creation called the human scene is accepted as if mind was substance law cause or activity we will be dealing with this world on a materialistic basis but the moment that we recognize the nature of the second chapter of Genesis creation as a mind creation devoid of substance cause law we are enabled to deal with it on its basis now this mind creation is, may, uh, is material sense or results in material sense 
which forms these pictures of human harmony and human discord. Material sense can give us material health or material disease, material wealth or material poverty, but always it is mind appearing as. Our function is to know that soul, or the word I, is the true creative being, maintaining and sustaining its spiritual creation through the avenue of spirit and discernible through our spiritual awareness. Then, to be able to look at the balance of this scene and see it for what it is, a mind formation devoid of substance, cause, law, reality, and then see where that leads you. This is so important for healing work that I am repeating this as it came through in over 10 hours yesterday, probably more intensified than this particular unfoldment ever came through before. It must be clear in this <clears throat> that God does not destroy material sense, that God cannot even be brought to any particular situation, but that the realization of God is the destruction of material sense. And uh, that it is not applied to anything as if God were being sifted down to this particular person's ills or this particular nation's lack or this particular incident in some geographical part of the globe. It must be made clear in your own consciousness that God doesn't do anything to you or for you or for those who come to you that the realization of God itself is the destruction of material sense. Only don't try to channel it here, there, or the other place, or to this condition or situation. Now this brings up an important point that was raised here this week. When I was asked how I work on a particular problem. And my answer is this. Every problem that is brought to my conscious awareness brings forth within me some spiritual response. In other words, in the situation of the boy with a fever, the first time that brought forth nothing but a click. And I had to be satisfied with that. But the second time, it brought forth a specific revelation of truth. There is no he, there is only I, and I is God. Now, <clears throat> when that it was said to me, the boy has a fever or the boy is ill. My thought did not go to the boy or to the fever. But the picture of a boy and a discordant boy was brought to my consciousness and that brought forth within me the response, there is no he, there is only I. Now in the same way, it makes no prob difference what problem is brought to me by anyone or if it is brought to me through a newspaper or radio, the moment the problem touches my consciousness, a response of a spiritual nature is brought forth within me, if not instantaneously, then through meditation. If, for instance, somebody cables me that somebody's dying, instantaneously some kind of a response comes. It may be in the form of nonsense, go about your business. Or it may come in the form of uh, dying, dying, life dying. No, life is God. And that would be the end of it. Or some other response in which a spiritual truth would replace whatever the appearance was that was handed to me. 
Now, so it is. If I sit down to work on, let us say, this advertising gadget. I don't think of advertising gadgets, but remember, it was an advertising gadget that sent me down to meditate. And therefore, either instantaneously or by waiting in meditation, a response comes within me and says to me that that is a mind action. It's a creation of the human mind. It's a man-made thing. It's a man-made creature. Therefore, it has no power in God. And who shall fear the creature? Since we understand the nature of the Creator. There's my treatment. That's the treatment not that I gave. Oh, no, I didn't give that treatment. That's the treatment that came to me that I was given on the subject of this advertising gadget. God gave me the treatment by saying to me, well, that gadget is man-created. Man-created. It's a creature. Shall you fear a creature more than the spiritual creator? Why, no, this is the second chapter of Genesis creation. And it's without form and void. It's dead. Now, I didn't think that up just then. I took the subject of uh, the advertising gadget and that's the response that was brought forth within me. Well now, I understand of course that this uh, particular gadget uh, is occupying such an important place in the human thought at the moment that I may have not nullified the entire activity of false advertising. I may have to work on this for a hundred years before the thing is entirely destroyed or false advertising is entirely destroyed in the human mind or it may come quicker than that but the idea is that it will never be met unless the treatment is given to me of God